Welcome to Psych for Psychology, a Nystrom and Associates podcast. Our host, Brett Cushing, is a licensed marriage and family therapist at Nystrom. Each week, he talks about all things mental health and therapy with guests, and you get a chance to dive into specific psychology topics that help promote personal development and wellness. And now, your host, Brett. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Psych for Psychology. My name is Krista Overson. I'm here with Brett Cushing. We are marriage and family therapists, and we have a special guest joining us today, Rasha Kovaleski. You got it. Who is also a therapist, I believe, mm-hmm. LPCC. I am an, which and is, an LADC. And a, mm-hmm. ooh, two licenses, so licensed professional clinical counselor mm-hmm. and licensed alcohol and drug counselor. Yep. And so we are, today is a special mystery episode where it's basically three therapists talking and somewhere in there we will discover our topic for the day. But we've been just laughing and having such a fun time that we thought, you know what, let's bottle up this moment and... Now there's going to be just complete silence. <laughs> right. <laughs> now that it's I said that. It's our shortest episode ever. We so started. thanks for coming, Rasha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Thank you for um, putting out that invitation to, uh, you sent an email to the whole company. Oh, yeah. Asking if anyone Recruiting. was interested. And yes. I love it. I'm grateful to be here. Um, we started by talking about hot flashes today. <laughs> yes. We did. And how Starbucks is struggling. <laughs> Those I'm, are, no, I'm two, struggling. Yeah, Brett's struggling because Starbucks is having a rough I had to go to three different Starbucks today. And uh, yeah, we were talking about... <laughs> hardship. Hardship. hardship, yeah. Oh. First world problems. And, yes, truly. truly. Uh, it, you know, we were talking actually about how how do we respond to that when our expectations aren't met. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of universal between the three of us that mm-hmm. we get frustrated. And well, Rasha is exemplary here because you've learned to be patient. I'm still learning. I'm over half century now old and I'm still learning to be patient, but we all kind of agreed when we get impatient and we hold on to those expectations that aren't working for us, we don't like that version of ourselves. We end up regretting that. And yet when we're patient and we're gracious, we usually don't regret that. So that was really an interesting start to our conversation. Mm -hmm. And that example was Chipotle. Yes. We were talking about Starbucks, and then Chipotle was a long, long wait. Yeah, I ordered online, and it was supposed to be ready at like 11.50, and I didn't leave Chipotle until 12.30 with my food. And I was thinking about it. Part of it was I could see all these young people running around and doing the work that they needed to do. They were fully staffed. It wasn't the case that, that, that Brett <laughs> described earlier where there was only one person, and that's why the line was so long. There were plenty of people there. And they all looked very young. They look, all look like teenagers. And I thought, they must be so stressed knowing that they have people waiting. Because I wasn't the only one waiting for, yeah. for my food. And, and I think that that's part of it. The mm-hmm. ability to empathize with the person who is expected to do something for me. Yep. There's the key word. Expected. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember... I think a couple of Saturdays ago, talk about expectations. I was, I, I'm because of my ADHD, the way I manage it is I live a very structured life. And so I got everything planned out all the time. And I, I have to like from nine to nine 50, I'm doing this and nine 50 to 10, whatever. Uh, I got it all planned out and everything was going wrong the entire day. None of my expectations were being met, but I know how to handle it. I just got angry. And <laughs> I, and when that didn't work, I knew what to do then because you huh. just intensify the anger and you hold on to those expectations, right? And I, harder. Hold on harder. I right? tell you, I felt so justified mm. in my anger. Mm. And at the same time, I didn't even like myself anymore. You know, I was yep. just like, wow, are you just really difficult to be with right now? And yet I wanted to hold on to all that anger at the same time. So what did you do? Well, how did you get through the... I, I thought I, I prayed and okay. I, I told God this, you know, he's really messing up and because <laughs> this is not working for me. Right. And because it's all about me. Yes, and, obviously. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, I just, it, I got to a point of just coming to the end of myself. It mm-hmm. took longer than it, than, you know, is probably best. Uh, it just took a long time. And 
then I just had to say, okay, well, nothing I can do, you know. And but it, I, I was just holding on to those expectations, and it took so long to yeah. let go of that. You've heard that statement: uh, expectations are premeditated resentments. Ooh, no, I haven't, but I sure like that. Yeah. Uh, say that again. Expectations are premeditated resentments. I feel like I'm in therapy with Rasha now. <laughs> I so, wish I was. Yeah, this is helpful. This the is way really you good. know that you're not in therapy with me is that you're not lying down. <laughs> okay, maybe I should lie down. You can if you want to. It looks okay. a little uncomfortable on the floor. Yeah. But. <laughs> well, this uh, is good. Say that again yeah. one more time. That is so good. That's Expectations good. are premeditated resentments. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Say more about that if you... Actually, what? you know what I what I thought of a moment ago was just how intoxicating righteous anger is. Mm. Um, you know, I, I've had some clients recently who are really struggling with people in their lives who, you know, if you think of a parent or you think of a spouse, there's a an ideal you have in your mind for how that person should act, how they should support you. Yeah. Um, and people let us down. They just do. They're human. Mm -hmm. They let us down. And when we know we're right, man, does it feel good to be angry. And it really to, does. It, it's intoxicating. And that's what I've been talking mm. with a few of my clients about recently. And I love to normalize that, that, that feeling you have in your chest when you just know you're right and you know you have the right to be angry. Yeah. Uh, and how hard it is to let go of that and how freeing it is. Can I share an example of that? Yeah. Uh, I do. This is a true story. I, uh, my wife and I, we, it was earlier on in our marriage and we were going to relatives' house. We're driving. We got into an argument. Uh, I think it was the only argument we've ever had. And I'm just kidding. So you guys look at me like, <laughs> we were, I was what? so in the story. I was like, yes. The so, only argument. Yes. Yes, I but, believe you. But I remember, you know why I remember this argument is because it was the one time that I was about 90% right. Uh -huh. You talk about that. What is it? Righteous For, anger? Or, righteous, righteous anger. Righteous anger. Mm -hmm. That's me. I was like 90% right. That's pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I remember. It's so mm -hmm. rare. So I am like not going to cave. You know, I'm not going to say I'm sorry or anything. There's this little voice in, inside me. I think it was God because it couldn't have been me. And saying, well, what are you going to do about your 10%? And I was so angry at this voice. And I'm like, well, wait a second. What about, I had an expectation that because I'm 90% right, I should be the one who's having an apology sent to me. And this little voice said, well, aren't you glad I don't interact with you that way? And yeah. so then I, I I sort of surrendered, sort of. Yeah. And I said, okay, but I can't do this because I knew I couldn't. And I just, I surrendered and I, I prayed and I'm like, all right, God, if this is you, you got to enable me to do this because to your point, I just couldn't do it. And for 20 minutes, it took me 20 minutes to be able to get to the point where I could say those words. Mm-hmm. I am sorry. And it opened up this great connection that we could actually talk about it. But I am, I'm not exaggerating. It was physically difficult for me to let go of that righteous anger that mm -hmm. I felt so entitled to. Yeah. And when it comes to anger, I think one of the ways in which it can be easier to let go of that is to recognize that everything, this is true for me, I don't know about you guys, but everything I get mad at other people about, it's stuff that I've done. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Big you know, time. I've been dishonest. I've been selfish. I've been self-centered and, mm -hmm. and the way that I've justified things in the past is, well, I just didn't do it as badly as they did or as often as they did. As often, so, or as, you know, right. that's why, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's why it's okay for me to be mad and yeah. for me to punish them in some way by either my words or I, you know, uh, stonewalling or mm -hmm. whatever kind of way that I want to make them pay for how they're treating me. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And if I can recognize, especially if it's somebody that we care about, like what's the bottom line? The bottom line is I love this person and I want this relationship to continue. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the next thing that I can do that, that emphasizes those facts? Right. You know, I love Gottman, for example. Yeah. love Gottman so much. John Gottman, by the way, is a marriage family <laughs> therapist researcher, just so people know. But yeah. yeah, go ahead. Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work is his book. And he's got YouTube, like, and just all sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorites is, I 
think it's about a 40 minute talk that he himself does. He's wearing his yarmulke and Mm -hmm. he uses his own marriage for examples. And he's Mm -hmm. just such a personable, cool dude. Mm -hmm. And he talks about responding to bids for connection. So in those moments when somebody is softening, recognize, oh, oh yeah, I love my husband. Okay, stop. Let's take some time. Let's let's move apart. Let's take, you know, self-soothe, yep. psychologically, uh, physiologically calm down and then come back and talk about this. Mm-hmm. Disconnect mm-hmm. from that righteous anger and figure out where can we meet. It is so hard. Go ahead. Were you oh, say I was just going to say, have you ever had, when you've talked about righteous anger with people, mm-hmm. have you, I've had a, um, a couple of experiences where people kind of push back on it and say like, I don't like being angry. And even myself, I, I remember when I learned about like how you get like a, uh, there's like this juice you get from righteous anger. Right. And I remember when I first heard that, even I resisted that because I was like, no, there's no way that means I like suffering. You know, like it was yeah. hard for me to reconcile that. So yeah, I was just curious if you've ever had that experience sure. where people and are like, no, I don't think I like being angry. <laughs> and I don't, I, mean, I, I don't want to generalize too much, mm-hmm. but especially for women, it's not socially acceptable for us to be angry. Mm-hmm. And and for men, too, you know, anger means that some kind of violence is going to happen. Again, right. a generalization. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think anger just gets a bad rap. Yeah. It's, I, it, it is a human emotion that has a purpose. Mm-hmm. And my thought at this moment is that the purpose is to tell me that there's something that needs to change. It's yeah, yeah. it's an alarm. Like yeah. all emotions, yeah. it's just an alert like hey, pay attention. Yep. And it's funny, I <laughs> this is really kind of amusing in in sessions I will ask clients you talk about how anger gets a bad rap. I'll, I'll clients will seem very angry and I'll say, "Oh, okay. Well, yeah, you seem you seem kind of angry." "Oh, no, no, I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm frustrated." <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. You're frustrated, you know. But it's, yeah. it's, and and I've done the same thing. I don't want to admit mm-hmm. that I'm angry, and I think it's because we've seen so many demonstrations of anger being destructive, mm-hmm. and we see so much destruction in its wake. So we don't really understand what constructive anger mm-hmm. looks like. And so when we have these unmet expectations, our anger goes up. How in the world do I do something constructive with that? Because we don't really see that modeled a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And when somebody accuses you of being angry, mm-hmm. I know the thought that I have is you're saying that you got my goat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you when you accuse me of being angry, then yeah. you're saying, ha ha, I yeah, got you. I got you. And yeah. so I'm definitely not going to admit that you made me angry. Yeah. Right. You know? And yeah, that's usually when I'm like, I've never been angry in my life. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> How yeah. dare you? I want to go back to expectations again. I think this is such an important topic. So you had started off, Brett, by sharing the example of the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, yes. right? Where which is great a great book, book right? Um, and I was so an expectation basically can be any any situation where you're you have a preconceived notion about how your like for example how your day is going to go. Mm-hmm. So then when we expect things of people, like what are some things? What are some examples of like things we might expect from people where then we're setting them up for a resentment? Okay. Well, for me, I know uh, what's really hard for me is I expect people to know how I feel. Ah, and I expect people to know what I want. I expect people to know what I need. Mm, and when read they, your mind, right? Right. And read yeah. my mind. Because I'm pretty good at that. Read my mind? Yeah. yeah. Because well, we're I am. therapists. We well, know. we're therapists, but I also grew up in a home where I just... Became kind of hyper vigilant for that. Kind of had to be to stay safe. Yeah. Probably. So I yep. know what everybody feels in a room. Yeah. I just have no idea what I'm feeling <laughs> at the time. Right. That's the challenge. Yeah. yeah. But I expect because I'm good yes. at that. I expect. I just assume everybody can do that. And then when mm-hmm. they don't, oh look, my expectation is not being met, mm-hmm. and I feel justified for being angry, and I feel entitled to being angry now. Yep. I just had a client yesterday describe a conflict with her her spouse. He wasn't feeling well at an event. They came home. He sat on the couch and she was like, oh, he's feeling better. I'm going to ask him to help with some of the household chores. She's like, hey, can you come help me with this? And he's like, ah, what? Mm-hmm. Really? You're really going to ask me that? So mind reading going on in both places. Right. She has assumed that he's okay. And he has assumed that she knows he's not okay. Mm-hmm. And 
And just t- we kind of talked through that. And she's like, I just and what I said to him was, you need to tell me that you're still not feeling OK. And I said, and I'm wondering whether you could say to him, are you feeling OK now? <laughs> Can you help me with what's going on? Like we do that, to, especially in couples. We do that to each other so much because we know each other so well. Yeah. Not only do we expect them to read our minds, we also believe we can read their minds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a dangerous game. My husband and I, uh, you know, August 31st will be 34 years we've been married. Wow. And we used to have these conversations much more frequently. I'm grateful to say we don't have to do it as often but we call them writing conversations, R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, like writing the boat. Ooh, nice. Mm. Because we would get into these patterns of reading each other's minds and expecting the other person to read ours. Wow. And we would get into arguments about everything. And then one of us would realize, oh, we're doing that mind reading thing again. Okay, yes. stop. I'm going to say what I mean. And I'm going to accept that what you're saying is what you mean. No, I think we do that. Like, yep. where do you want to go out to dinner? I don't care. <laughs> well, that sounds to me like maybe you don't want to go out to dinner or you're going to be mad about the place that I choose or what's really going on. Instead, I'm going to ask you, hey, what's what's up with the tone of voice? What's going on there? Mm-hmm. Do you want to go out to what's happening mm-hmm. instead of just assuming? And we learn right. that as therapists. Ask right. those open ended questions. Yes, exactly. And it's hard because I know I'm not alone. Many people have no idea. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know why I don't want to go. And we feel like we have to know and we have to justify exactly what we're thinking and feeling and wanting. And sometimes it's okay to say, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And to have that space and grace to be able to say, that's okay. You don't have to know. Yeah. 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 And and. It's kind of amazing to me how often my husband just steps up. I had this day where I was just so, it was a Sunday, you know, what, what do they call them? The Sunday scaries? Have you heard yes. of that? Yes. Yeah. Ooh, that'd be a good topic. And that's sometime. where you're kind of, it would. Yeah. Is that where you're kind of like dreading the work week? Dreading like, going to work the next day. Kind of sad the weekend's ending. Yep, yeah. Exactly. And I just had a day where I was feeling very down and my husband was like, do you want to go out to dinner? Do you want to go for a hike? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Do you want to just sit on the couch? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. I really don't know. Right. Yeah. And he said, go get dressed, get in the car. We're going to go for a ride and listen to some music. And when we're hungry, we're going to just stop wherever we are. Mm -hmm. He just came up with that idea. How did you feel about that? It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I didn't have to make any decisions. We just got in the car and listened to music. Did you know at that time you didn't want to make any decisions? Because it sounds like you didn't want to, but you didn't know to articulate that. But he knew somehow after all these years, like, this is what you need. You don't know you need it. Yeah. So. And it's not like he can do that all the time. No. Yeah. And that day he did it. And he does it, I would say, frequently throughout our marriage. He's, he's, I don't know, he, as I said to you guys before, he's not a therapist. He's never even seen a therapist before. Mm-hmm. He's one of those magical people that mm-hmm. is uh, stable. He's, he's a rock. And, yes. and just seems to know sometimes how to be helpful to others. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, yeah. I really lucked out. Sounds like a good guy. Yeah. We yeah. just get him on the podcast. Right. Yeah. I kind of want to meet him <laughs> He'd now. He'd probably refuse. Oh, okay. <laughs> he does have anxiety, some anxiety. So. Okay. Well, he's human. Yeah. Or at least yeah, we yeah. know he's human. So. I, I think I would have to ask him. I'm curious to know whether he'd say yes or no. Well, I have an expectation that he will. And so. Yeah. I, I have all sorts yes. of expectations. I have prepared and premeditated <laughs> resentment. <laughs> resentment. <laughs> yes. There it is. Okay. Again. So expecting people to know our needs and how yeah. we yeah. feel. Other ones, even just like expecting there to be no traffic, right? Like there's yes. an expectation I often have is that when I leave my where I'm where I'm leaving from and that my drive is going to be smooth, there's going to be no issues on the road. That's an expectation mm-hmm. I frequently have that's rarely met. <laughs> yeah. Right? Getting a little on the other side of the curtain with being a therapist. Uh-huh. Exactly. How about expectations for clients to get better? Mm. more quickly I'm so glad you yeah said that's that. big frustration that oh big time mm-hmm. or like expectation that if we work on this thing or that you know we've been working together a certain amount of time that this is going to happen this outcome is going to happen uh-huh <sighs> or that homework assignments get done 
yeah. or suggestions mm-hmm. get followed. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about once uh, on the podcast, uh, Dr. Karen Ryan talked about radical acceptance. And it's the idea that you know, the more we try to control something that's out of our control, the more that something or someone ends up controlling us. And so we need to surrender or we need to have this radical acceptance that, you know what, there's not a whole lot I can do here. Mm-hmm. And I, when I, as a DBT therapist too, a lot of my clients, they hate radical acceptance. <laughs> and I get it because we don't like giving up control. Mm-hmm. And yet a, every day as we're talking, like notice every day we have expectations of people mm-hmm. uh, of our uh, at our work environment, at our home, strangers on the road, driving in front of us. Our day is just littered with expectations. Mm-hmm. And I think of that skill of radical acceptance to deal with it. And mm-hmm. how how else can we, in the time we have left, what can we do to kind of identify solutions? Because this is Thank such you. an everyday thing. Actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because a little earlier I was thinking like, okay, expectations. They're like, I, I expect things all day long every day. So like, yeah, what is the antidote to mm-hmm. having expectations? So you brought up radical acceptance, which I think is... Great. Even though you said your clients hate it. Yes. <laughs> it yeah, well, it's so hard. The, well, it, that's the thing about radical acceptance, I think, is it's so hard, but it's so simple. Right? Well, most profound things are. Yes, yes. exactly. Which I think is why it's easy to be like, radical acceptance again, right? Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds me of that thing about don't give up. Because usually when you give up, it's actually right before something's about to change. Mm. And it feels like that's what radical, like the pain from radical acceptance is all about what happens right before you decide to freaking radically accept. And when you do like the relief of just, there's nothing that I can do. And I accept that. And I know that, and I'm going to act as if I believe it Mm -hmm. and move forward through my life, recognizing I can't uh, make my mother sober, for example. Right. Mm-hmm. I can't uh, force a connection with my sister-in-law who doesn't like me. <laughs> I can't. Mm-hmm. I can't right. do it, this thing. The list goes on and on. And yeah, I yeah. think of in, in Al Anon, they talk about like the three or four C's. I didn't. I didn't cause this. I can't control it. I can't cure it. Mm-hmm. And what an interesting way to start a day, kind of preemptively rather than reactively trying to go to radical acceptance when we're already frustrated and angry that our expectations aren't met. But maybe preemptively, proactively start a day mm-hmm. and say, all right, I'm just going to radically accept there's a lot of things that are going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I didn't necessarily cause it. I cannot control it. I can't cure it. Okay, I'm going to surrender and start the day and do this throughout the day. Well, and that, so I think that's a really good point because I think some people might hear that and say, well, what, are you just expecting your day to go wrong all the time? Like, I think there's, <laughs> yeah. to the other end of the extreme is like, oh, well, don't expect anything good to happen. Yeah. That- but what, you're, what we're talking about is maybe as you're thinking about the day ahead, kind of hold it lightly. Right. Like yeah. yes. the schedule or whatever it might be mm-hmm. just because I forget to do that to work because I'll have a day that's totally packed and I'm like, it's locked in. And then like five things change throughout the day. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I'm used to that now, at least at work, because things are kind of, you know, always in flux. But yeah, that's yeah. an excellent distinction because we don't want to be Eeyore, you know, throughout right. the day. Like, well, oh, everything's to- terrible. Right. Me, you know? and, <laughs> Nothing's going to go my way. Right. So we don't want to go from one extreme to the other because that's that dichotomous all or nothing thinking. Right. So we don't want to go from everything's got to go my way to <laughs> nothing's going to go my way. But we want to have that dialectical balance of the middle. Yeah. It's, hey, this is great. Celebrate things went our way and what we were hoping and accept and release that some things don't. Mm-hmm. Solid goals with flexible ways of getting to those goals. There you go. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know for me, meditation is key. I meditate mm-hmm. twice a day and it helps. I feel like I meditation does a couple of things for me. One of the things that it does is it allows me a few minutes to let my brain run around in the backyard, kind of like a puppy, oh, get I all like that, that energy yeah. out. I like that image. I'm grateful to say that it's not like that. Usually 
I, I meditate for 20 minutes twice a day. And mm-hmm. usually the entire 20 minutes isn't the running around in the backyard. Probably the first half is. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I get to this place of, okay, I'm, I'm chanting. I have, I have, I do transcendental meditation. So it's nice. a chanting a mantra, yeah. ch- chanting the mantra in my mind and just feeling this level of peace, wow. uh, connection with my higher power. Yep. Right. And uh, that helps me. And I think one of the big keys to avoiding expectations and premeditated making premeditated resentments is staying in the present mm-hmm. in mm. this moment. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. Yep. You guys are okay. We're all healthy. We're all breathing air. Uh, hopefully none of us is in any real pain. Mm-hmm. Everything is okay right now. And I know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And I have control over Right now, I don't have control over what just happened. I have no control over what's going to happen. I have control right now. There's a parable. I think it's a Russian parable about a little boy and a fox in the deep, dark woods. Hmm. And the fox can see everything because it's a fox and it's got the, the vision of a fox. And the little boy can't see anything and he's crying. And he says to the fox, I can't see anything. I can't see my way out of the woods. And the fox says, I can see everything. If you look down, can you see the next step that you have to take? And the little boy looks down and he can see the next step. And he goes, that's all you have to do. Just Mm -hmm. take the next step. And I think that that's a big key for avoiding expectations. Mm -hmm. Just do, stay in the present, do the next thing that's on on your list. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the only thing you have any control over is is right there and right then. Hard. How peaceful that feels. I don't know. It feels peaceful for me. It does. And, <laughs> it does and it's, for me it's too. again, like you were saying, Krista, it's so easy and yet so hard, mm-hmm. hard to remember. Um, but maybe we can be proactive and just sort of thinking about how am I going to live today? And mm-hmm. I'm going to live it in the present moment. I'm going to I think of that old 38 special song by the group 38 special. Hold on loosely, but don't let go. If you cling too tightly, you're going to lose, lose control. control. And I'm not going to sing it, but <laughs> please do. Yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> when we stop recording. So nonetheless, uh, it, it really speaks to what you're talking about here, mm-hmm. that this is so crucial for us. And all of us have been through so much in the last few years, mm-hmm. like with the pandemic, with all of the craziness that's going on in the world. The other thing that that I've found helpful and my clients have found helpful is recognizing, look at all the things I've already been through and I've made it through these things. Mm. No matter what happens, I'm going to make it through. I love that. You know, there's that that other one that I like. Um, it's all going to be okay in the end. And if it's not okay yet, that just means it's not, it's not the, the end. end. <laughs> yeah. right? like, I like that. And if it's not... I'll, it's going to, it's going to happen. I'm going to make it through it. Mm-hmm. And maybe this little next part is a little dark, but if I don't make it through it, it means that I'm not here anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's not, there's nothing I can do anyway. Mm. Right. <laughs> More radical acceptance. Right. Yep. Yeah. There's a constant theme of, of control here too. And yeah. I, I don't want to be oversimplifying uh, our diagnostic manual that we use, the DSM-5, mm-hmm. to come up with mental health diagnoses. But when I look at it and read that incredibly long book, maybe in a way that's oversimplifying, I would suggest that many of our mental health disorders center around issues of control. control. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. if we could just wrestling let with it in right. some cases, yeah, um, yeah. or in all cases, wrestling with control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, man, I want to talk for five more hours. Me too. Is that cool, guys? Maybe we could just do a five-part episode, five-part series <laughs> of us just like chatting for riffing, riffing, riffing. Love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we actually gave up control in doing this one because we didn't know where we were going to go. Right, you guys. It's a play oh. within a play. It's a play <laughs> within a play. We gave up control, and we were like, you know what? I bet there's a. I bet there's an episode in here. And look at that. We talked about expectations, and, and we talked about. Reference. You know what? what? Even if- though. We must know we're at the end because yeah. we're everything's up. okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Boom. That's right. Boom. Mic, mic drop? Mic, mic drop. drop. Oh, we, don't wanna, yeah. we don't want to drop this. Well, we can't do a mic drop because now we just commented on it. You know, you just have to say it and <laughs> yeah, then right. end. So yeah, got not it. quite a mic drop, but we're close. And Hey, this was really fun. Thank Russia. you so much for having me. I Thanks. really appreciate it. I love talking with you guys. Yeah. Thanks Can you say that us. one more time yeah. again uh, about 
expectations and resentment? Sure. Expectations are premeditated resentments. Yes. And radical acceptance and being in the moment is what can help us deal with those unmet expectations. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll look forward to talking again real soon. Thank you as always for listening, and please be sure to leave us a review. While this podcast can't be a replacement for therapy, we hope you enjoyed our discussion today and join us again next time. Nice German Associates is always available to those who are struggling. If you find yourself in need of support and help, please check us out at nicestermcounseling.com.